So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third uh, series of Paraspar organized by the Office of Communications, Indian Institute of Science. Paraspar is a platform that uh, you know facilitates uh, dialogues and conversation between various knowledge systems. We have had two series so far. Uh, first was on the joy of discovery in science, and the second one was on science and society. Today we are starting the third series, Understanding India. In this series, we are, um, you know, uh, uh, moving away, but not excluding science and technology to talk about, you know, uh, the, uh, the broader issues of the nation and uh, some uh, infrequently spoken about or discussed, you know, issues of the country. So in this series, we are very happy to have Nisha Susan today to inaugurate this webinar series. Uh, Nisha needs no introduction in the literary world, Indian literary world. Uh, you know, her, she uh, uses... Uh, wit and humor to talk about uh, very serious and crucial issues and I really enjoy her writings but uh, to give you a short introduction of the speaker today. Uh, Nisha Susan is a writer and editor. She grew up in India, Nigeria, Oman and lives in Bangalore. She is the co-founder of two award-winning media companies, The Ladies Finger and Grist Media. She currently writes Chip Trills, a column on millennials, time and obsession for Mint Launch. She was formerly features editor at Helka magazine and also commissioning editor for Yahoo Originals, a long form destination for Yahoo India. Her nonfiction is focused on culture, gender and politics. Her uh, fiction has been published by N plus one, Caravan, Penguin, Zuban and others and often explores int intimacy and strangeness that the internet has brought to India. Her first collection of short fiction, The Woman Who Forgot to Invent Facebook and Other Stories was published in 2020 last year. So Nisha, uh, welcome to Paraspar, uh, and we are uh, very excited to listen to you. I Thanks. will. Uh, be happy yeah. to. Yeah. Just tell me whenever you want to share. Uh, I'm I'm good to go. We we can start anytime. Okay. Okay. Sure. Is it seen? Yes, it's all good. Um, thank you, Bitasta, and thank you, Indian Institute of Science, for having me on this talk. Um, I mean, apart from generally being pleased to be invited to talk, it's always flattering. But I'm also happy because I started thinking about this series and, uh, you know, what, what it means. And uh, the thing that I think, you know, when you start thinking very specifically for a particular uh, moment, all kinds of different ideas come together. And sometimes it's a big kichdi. And to an extent, this afternoon is also going to be a kitchen, but I'm quite excited to serve you this kitchen, right? So let's let's start. Um, my talk is called I Didn't Know It, But Now I Do, Understanding Without Italics. And um, as we go along, you will realize that I'm not talking about italics, literally. I am talking about italics, uh, the data letters in English language, but also not just italics. Uh, wh why do we care about italics at all? Uh, we'll find out as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, small, conjure small background story. So background story, uh, this uh, story is from the year 2012. I have a close and dear friend called Jugal, and Jugal in turn has a close and dear friend. The close and dear friend, um, we should give him a name. Uh, let's call him Naveen. Naveen was in the middle of this whole arranged marriage circus. His brain was like totally fried at that point. So Naveen meets Jugal and says, dude, I've seen now six girls and I'm, I don't want to see any one, you know, not even one more because I'm totally depressed by this process. So the next girl that my parents set me up with, I'm just going to marry her. Jugal, uh, at this point, tries very hard to convince his friend that this is a stupid idea. I mean, if you must go through arranged marriage, then go through the whole thing and find someone that is a good arrangement was his uh, attempt to convince uh, his friend Naveen. The example that he used was a very unfortunate example. He said, well, you know, people see 30 houses before they rent one. How can you decide who to marry by just meeting six girls? So uh, with this new uh, little recharge, Naveen goes out and meets a seventh girl. As it turns out, this is a very important meeting in this conversation, and it was a good conversation. He asked her, what do you do to, you know, relax? What, what do you do, uh, you know, to just uh, have fun? And she said, uh, I watch Korean dramas. And this is 2012, so the idea of meeting a woman in the whole arranged marriage circus who had an unusual 
uh, pastime watching Korean dramas excited him and charmed him. And it was sort of enough for him to get to know her better. And then they got married. And I presume they now live in, well, I do know, actually, I'm not presuming. They live in Belgium and they cycle everywhere. Why am I telling you these like totally random story? Just to give you a sense of how quickly between 2012 and 2021, K-dramas have become part of our world right now. Uh, it would be hard for me uh, to meet anyone who hasn't watched at least one K-drama. Usually the problem is, like, you know, if you try to break the ice by having a K-drama conversation, it, it becomes like a big, um, big fight because someone is obliged to tell you their favorite whole genre of K-dramas and then you are obliged to write down and promise to watch these shows. So how is it that a completely new country, its culture, its subculture of TV shows, the sub-sub-genres can become part of our lives so easily. So that is that is like linked to the question of uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, the next slide, please. What did I learn from watching TV? So uh, recently I asked this question on, on Twitter because you know I was really interested in how a lot of subtitled television is now available on, on, on the streaming uh, channels and it's this fun to watch, it's easy to watch. There's such a big range. Uh, I'm not a big K-drama person, but I do watch other shows in other languages every now and then. So this is something I learned from watching a show called uh, Betty in New York. And I learned that in Latin America, the Miss Universe winners are referred to as La Miss. I just found this very entertaining. So then uh, I asked other people, you know, what else have you learned? Uh, what else have you learned by watching uh, TV in other other languages from other cultures, right? Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, okay. So this is the other thing I learned. So I was watching the show called Call My Agent, and I found out that when young French people like they want to text, sorry, you know, you know how sometimes young people will text like abbreviations, and well, I shouldn't say young people. I should also say my mother, but like let's just say some people like to text abbreviations for shocking number of things like OK becomes K, right? So in the same way, uh, you know, people sometimes text SRY for sorry or, or even SOZ for sorry. Soz. So when French young people want to text sorry, instead of saying désolé, they say DSL. I don't know why this, I just found it very entertaining. So on, on Twitter, I asked other people what they had learned and uh, this is what I found out. Next slide. Uh, among many comical and sweet things, the thing that I like the most is that uh, when Danish people say, uh, you know, goodbye, they say hi, hi. And it's actually pronounced hi. And I just found this very charming for some reason. So why is this, um, you know, a discussion at all? Why are we talking about Korean TV or Danish TV? I mean, quite apart from the fact that all the time that when I'm supposed to be writing, I'm actually, you know, watching TV and trying to find out new shows instead of like reading literature and expanding my mind. That is, of course, one aspect of it. The other is to figure out how quickly and how easily do we uh, enter cultural uh, artifacts, you know, which are supposedly alien, but then totally make it uh, comprehensible and not at all difficult to love, right? Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, so, you know, in 2015, you know how online trends move really fast? In 2015, I remember people used to say, I did a thing and it would be like, I did a thing and underneath that it would be, you know, I don't know, I won the Nobel Prize, no, not quite, but almost that, I did a thing. So nobody says that anymore, but just in a sort of retro way, I did a thing. And last year in 2020, I published a book. I wrote a book, it was published. It, this is a book, it's called The Women Who Forgot to Invent Facebook and Other Stories. Uh, so the book uh, has a lot of internet and uh, tech related uh, themes. Um, it's um, 12 stories set in different parts of the country. Uh, appropriately, you know, the people in the stories speak very differently. And I thought that was a normal thing. However, something happened, which is when my book was published and I started reading the reviews, I got a lot of reviews and I was very happy to be reviewed. And uh, they were mostly very nice reviews. Actually, they were universally nice reviews, which is a disgusting thing to proclaim in the middle of your presentation. Please ignore me. So. I got a lot of reviews. And so in the reviews, one of the 
repetitive uh, detail or like a late motif that appeared is that people remarked on how often I have uh, non-English words in my stories and the non-English words uh, were a range uh, from different languages. So there's Malayalam, there's Tamil, there's Kannada, there's Hindi. Um, is there any other? I think that's that's pretty much it. I mean, basically the languages that I speak and a lot of people remarked on how it's there. There's no explanation for it. There's no italics and it's just there naturally. And almost all the reviews said that this was fun, that they didn't have a problem with it, that it was enjoyable, but it was something that everyone remarked on. So once they remarked on it, I started thinking about it. Had I thought about it earlier? Honestly, no. I mean, it's it's in my head, it's something that I've thought about a long time ago and have not thought about in the recent past. I feel like people understand a lot more than we give credit for. So I didn't feel like we needed to give explanations for many of these words. Um, and between me and my editors, we were on the same page. So forget giving explanations or footnotes or glo glossary or whatever. We didn't even italicize. So just to give you an example of the kind of sentences that uh, were remarked on. Uh, the next slide, please. This was a sentence. Uh, so this is a sentence about a, a guy who is in, uh, like a college student who is doing a bit of trolling, like doing a, a play making fun of girls from a girls college, right? So the sentence, one of them wore a bra over his salwar bottom and pranced around speaking in a fake ash posh Malayali girl voice. Okay, so this, this word, um, the ash posh is what is not italicized, right? So what is the problem here? Not that the review said that there is a problem, but it's interesting that it was remarked on. Uh, next slide, please. Why do we use italics? Where did italics come from? I mean, uh, this is usually a cue. Like if, a, if you go to a quiz and you know somebody says, where, does, where do italics come from? Usually you'd immediately think it's obviously not from Italy. It must be like from China or Germany, or I'm sure it's from China. And then you get like extra two points, right? But in this case, actually, well, quite apart from the fact that everything does come from China, pretty much everything comes back from China. But <laughs> Italics do come from Italy. So in when uh, things became printed, like when we, things were moving from handwritten to printed, there was a there was a period of fonts which imitated or typefaces which imitated the handwritten form. So the italics sort of imitated the more uh, traditional handwritten cursive style, right? And as, as language and printing and printing technology and all of those things have evolved, the meaning of italics have changed to other kinds of things. So you could use italics in English for emphasis. Like, so you say, he sh shouted, look, a coconut. <laughs> okay, and then you could put look, a coconut in italics and the reader would understand that there was like a shout or you say he is the last person I want to see and you put the word last in italics you you can hear the emphasis right so there is one kind of use of italics but the italics usage that we are interested in here is the issue of foreignness which is that you put a word in italics because you know you don't want to scare people by thinking you made a typo right so you're indicating to them that don't worry it's not in English it's not a printing mistake. It's just another word. So that usage of italics is what we are discussing here today. Uh, next slide, please. So some more sentences from, from my book, Words Without Italics, the first one you've already seen. He's very tall now, nearly six feet, and working at a gym after school so that he can body banao for free. Or the next one, she didn't smoke or eat meat, but they had the air of the greatest tamsik in South Delhi, so loose were her eyes, so knowing were her thick lips. Anita was secretly Konjam Mother Teresa type, right? So uh, if, you, if you look at these uh, sentences, uh, the, the first story is set in Kochi. Um, it is narrated by a Malali woman from Kochi. Uh, the second story is, is set in Delhi. It's narrated by uh, a woman in uh, working class Delhi. 
Uh, the the third one is also set in Delhi, but it's it's told the story is told by a Malali man, and from Bombay living in Delhi, and and the fourth one is told by a Tamil girl, uh, working in an ad agency in Bangalore. Okay, so to me, it seemed perfectly natural and normal that this is how they would speak. And I'm sure as you read it, you also feel like, huh, this is how people speak, right? This is how I speak, or you speak. Um, it's also to me interesting that there are words here that people found like fun or unusual and other words that they didn't. For instance, if you looked at the third sentence, which is tamsik. So one reviewer said that it was fun to see the word tamsik in, in print, but it's interesting that the word loosh, which is, I don't even know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I mean, I have, I know the meaning, is not something that people are saying, oh, how unusual that she has used this like strange French origin word. It's not strange, it's, mm, it's a bit hard. It's a hard word. So, so it's not about using French words. It's not about using hard words. Then what is, what is it? Why is it? Uh, important or important enough to remark on the words tamsik or ashposh or body banao or konjum, right? Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, when I made this slide, I had a lot of fun just like giggling at this slide because I have Hemingway and then I have Murakami and I have me. Okay, now having made this slide, now you guys have to deal with my slide. Uh, how do writers deal with the issue of foreign words? So Hemingway writing in the 20s, 1920s, uh, not this Wala 20s, uh, writing in the 1920s, had a lot of Spanish in some of his books. Uh, how did he deal with it? No italics, no explanation. It's just there. You understand, don't understand. Your problem. Okay. Um, Murakami, who doesn't write in English, um, but is translated like immediately into English uh, and by very, very fine translators. So how they deal with it is by not having a lot of Japanese words in the middle to evoke the Japanese-ness of uh, Murakami. They do other sorts of things. They And it's there, there is a high level of skill involved uh, in both the original work as well as in the translation where uh, a person sees another person, I mean, I'm just giving you a Murakami example, a person sees another person on the uh, at the railway station and says he had a distinct, um, I don't know, uh, Tokyo accent, okay, or he had a distinct, distinct uh, Kyoto accent. And then by, by making a remark that one Japanese character would make in a normal sort of way, um, the reader, even in English, is reminded of the fact that this is set in Japan and it's a completely different world and it's not an anglophone world it's an it's a it's a world where the where the language that people are hearing all the time is Japanese so they're thinking what what the accent means in local provinces not in terms of English so you get a full feel of the world of Murakami uh, without having you know every sentence may two two three three uh, Japanese words uh, in the way that you know, if you read like really like bad, bad fantasy or amateurish fantasy and science fiction, like when people are writing science fiction and uh, fantasy for the first time, there's a lot of like inventing of words and cultures and this whole uh, business of world building. So the way of dealing with it is like having some like, made up Laddu kind of word in every uh, sentence and it has italics and uh, then it's supposed to impress the reader and the, after some time the reader is like pressing their head. So there is that danger which is avoided uh, or by Murakami and his translators by being just like very, very fine in the way they're thinking through this. And also because the original world is not interested in explaining or translating anything. Now we come to the third writer, which is me. So I believe, <laughs> I think it's fun to use words from different languages, not as um, like fusion dance number, not like that, but that is how uh, we speak as Indians. So we have a, a smallish, smallish population for whom English is the primary language, which is just over two lakh, but we have millions and millions of people for whom it's a comfortable secondary language. And in that way, English is our own and we've made it our own in very, very 
impressive and exciting ways. So uh, recently someone was sharing a photo from a bank in um, Bangalore and the, the notice said, please don't use staples because it will damage your check. Please use Gundpin. Okay, and I, I mean, I saw it in writing for the first time, Gundpin, and I just felt so pleased because it's a very specific description and saying anything else would have not really worked there. So that ability of uh, us to sort of integrate other languages into our uh, everyday speech is unfortunately not reflected a lot in Indian writing in English. It's not quite reflected because in, in, in our education and our training and in what is valued in cultural practice, a kind of more um, conservative way, form of English is what is valued. So uh, how we speak naturally is not quite reflected in Indian writing in English that much, even now. Um, I'm saying this after having six months of people pointing this out to me. I'm, I'm happy to have not thought of it while I was writing a book, let me just say. So yes, so that's my approach to put it in, to have no explanation, to have no footnote, but to work it in other ways. So for instance, in the sentence, so I, I think it's, I think it is entirely possible for readers to understand things. And it's also possible for writers to give them clues to work, which it ways it would go. So body banao in the gym becomes very like easy to understand. Ash posh, even though it's like a slightly dated Malayalam slang from another zamana, uh, because the word posh is there, you kind of get it. Okay. Sometimes you don't get it. And I'm okay with that because it's fine. Like if you don't understand what hatta kata is, it's, it's okay. But I, I have a distinct memory of learning the phrase hatta kata when a friend pointed out to another friend's new boyfriend and said, he looks kind of good, right, hatta kata. And I immediately understood the meaning just by looking at him and just getting the feeling of approval with which it was used, right? So I, I imagine that my reader is also like that and sort of gets it and moves along without any need for explanations, right? Um, moving to the next slide, please. So why do people continue to use italics and explanations? So even really modern books, which have come out in like 2019, 2020, continue to have italics in like really like strange places. So it's not just in books. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist. I, I write for numerous publications. Numerous, what a horrible word. But I write for a bunch of publications. <laughs> So uh, one of the process that happens as a freelance writer, is you get commissioned by the editor to write X piece or Y piece or sometimes a column which is recurring. And then, you know, it takes a, sort of a little back and forth to understand what is the style of the magazine, what are things that are OK, not OK um, in terms of language use. And the person who does that translation of what is language used for you in a publication is the person at the desk. Now, people working at the desk are like, crucial to publications, the other ones who keep it standing, right? Otherwise, you will have big egg on face, right? So, but it's not about just fact checking, because the fact checking is very important. It's not about punctuation, though punctuation is very important. And if any desk person has worked with me, they know that I have very bad punctuation. So thank you. It's also about having a sense of what is um, a public language, what is current. So like my using the word numerous, it sounds like I'm writing a government missive. So, you know, a good desk person would remove that and put a more like regular type word. So it also in India means um, to an extent legislating the desk gets to decide, okay, is this an acceptable Indianism? Is it an acceptable um, language, uh, uh, word from a language that people will understand, or do we need to translate? How much do we need to translate? Those are questions that people at the desk are making all the time, right? So um, sometimes the problems are complex and it's hard to guess what is the right thing to do. People just take a sort of aesthetic call. Sometimes it is governed by strange things. Like for instance, in the years that I worked in Delhi, uh, and even more recently, uh, as recently as 2020, I find that uh, Delhi-centered publications have 
a limited understanding of the world outside of Delhi, Haryana, or UP. So everything beyond that becomes like terribly exotic and terribly far. Right? So uh, the best example would be I had a colleague who uh, one week we had a story in an entire magazine. We had one story about Rajnikanth because it was a new movie. And in the next week, we had a story which was about some other movie which had won an award from a movie from Tamil Nadu, which had won an award, a national award. And uh, my colleague's remark to me was and said in complete goodwill, isn't this too much South India? So it's like two pieces in two weeks, which had some South Indian movie was just too much. So this is a little bit of too much South India problem, which leads to imagining that uh, the monolingualism of Hindi, uh, of Delhi, of a certain Hindi English Delhi is what the rest of the country speaks in. Uh, we don't. We speak in many, many, many different ways in South India, in in the West, in the East. Uh, you know, all the way all over the country. Basically, every 50 kilometers, we speak completely differently from each other, and that's okay. How do you integrate that in in the publications which are deemed themselves national? It's a very complicated question. If you just decide it's going to be all Hindi then you know that's a political choice that you're making and it might be an unquestioned political choice which is which is what i want to uh, suggest that it's not easy but it is a question that we should have why should we not translate hindi but translate everything else like so if i put in a hindi word nobody feels the need to translate it but they want to translate any other kannada tamil malayalam telugu as me is anything that i include then you know that's a question why is that right um Okay, so is it, you know, Tumba difficult? So the Tumba difficult problem is also interesting because, you know, in, in both in journalism and in publishing, we use big English words all the time, like obstreperous or uh, louche or, you know, there's a word called enervate. You, it sounds like something like you drink to get like lots of energy and run around, but enervate actually means draining your energy apparently. So I try not to use this word because it worries me. But in that way, a lot of English is difficult. So we don't worry about the difficulty of a word when we are marking it in ITALS. It is about the alienness, the foreignness. So, you know, when you're talking about people in the West publishing non-Western, non-English things, then putting everything in ITALS, that's one kind of discussion. It's a discussion about politics and North-South and colonialism and colonial hangover and all that. But when we talk about it in India, what are the words that we choose to italicize or choose to gloss, choose to footnote? Again, that is about politics and it's not about the difficulty of a word, right? Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, Samosa and the Fog. You know, I've made this slide title and I looked at it and I said, this should be the name of a really good bar. What do you think? The Samosa and the Fog. But actually, you know, it's not about a good bar. Uh, the fog that I'm referring to here is a kind of fog of defamiliarization. Um, defamiliarization is a nice word. It means exactly as it sounds. Uh, you take something that you know and through language, you make it really alien. Like a really good example that uh, my friend once gave me was she said, my mother has given supari. To someone to have someone else killed. I was like, what are you talking about? Okay, why would your mother give supari? So in in whatever in her twisty twisty way, finally I understood that her mother had called a rat killer to come and kill rats in the house. So she had given the, the guy supari. So in in using this way of talking, you have defamiliarized what is a completely like, oh, I called a guy to come and have rats killed in the house. So the fog of defamiliarization can work in different ways. So when people write nonfiction about India, sometimes they write to me, write things like they write 50 sentences where one sentence is required and making things sound very complex and exotic in, I mean, actually they're kind of daba normal, right? Or for instance, the samosa, which, you know, you eat it, you don't eat it. You may know what it means. You may not know what it means. You like it, you don't like it. It's not that difficult. Should you have samosa brackets, flaky pastry folded in triangular shape with 
potato filling in the middle of your i don't know climactic scene you would think that i'm making a joke here but actually books that have come out in 2019 2020 um indian writing in english have like brackets samosa explanation or footnotes explanation it's just like baffling and creating fog of incomprehension um next slide please so <laughs> which brings me to what i'm calling the okat problem so it's if it's not about the difficulty of the language or you know big big letters so many letters what do we do now then it comes back to what i would call the okat problem the okat problem is just deciding who decide who decides who understands things and who does not understand things who decides that some language is too complicated for me to understand and that person should now explain everything to me so you know indian writers in english who are published in the west or you know people from non western countries or uh, originating their diaspora you know a korean american whatever the works all of them have this common problem of my god why does the anglo saxon publishing scene make us explain everything which we do not want to explain okay so there is that problem but also like i was saying it's not just an english non english in the west problem it's also an problem in the in our own country where english is a very very um, complicated phenomena but also a phenomena that all of us have to deal with so in books in um, in magazines in in speech what do we decide is understandable comprehensible uh, or not is all because of our okat now if you d- you didn't know the word okat right now and you kind of get it that it's a hindi word thanks to my explanation without actually explaining the word okat you already know what i'm saying so hence let's move on to the next slide so the question is is it about the names of things for instance okay somebody doesn't know what a samosa is you know you can look it up you can google it or all of those things so things are much easier in terms of the names of things or simple meanings uh, now so it is in that why is it important for someone to understand or not understand the word samosa it is in that when when we uh, take art and cultural artifacts into our hearts then other kinds of things happen so um i said i don't watch a lot of korean drama and i mean i think it's very good but it's almost too good in the sense that i can't just blankly watch it and also like fold my clothes at the same time or cook it's it's, it's de- deeply absorbing as worlds and i i almost feel like i don't have enough heart to watch much of it i can watch little bits and just love it and maybe little bits a week later uh, i can't binge the other problem that i experience with k drama is that in every single scene someone is eating something okay so i came to the conclusion that i can only watch it after having a, like a large meal otherwise i would become 350 kgs after you know one season of some show but the thing about people eating in every scene in a k drama also something that i related to deeply because of another kind of thing it's not because i understand what they're eating there's so many things there and all looks tasty but it's not like i can you know google everything or even eat everything in the same way that you know people of a certain generation when you read in it blighton you try to imagine what these things that all the kids in famous five and five and daughters were eating or for a later generation what people uh, in the harry potter universe were eating which were half real half imaginary food and you try to imagine what it was it's all that and so you learn the names of things you google it whatever it's not that it's more than that do you when you watch the korean shows get the same feeling that i do that this is a culture where you never eat alone right you'd never feel like you'd be alone uh, or you never have to watch someone else eating and not be offered some food there is a kind of um i don't know what the word is there is a kind of warmth and a sort of community living around food that makes me feel like oh i really get this because i'm from bangalore and in bangalore the way to greet each other in a lot of places is to ask otaita which is like have you had lunch or you know have you had a meal and i find that 
deeply warm and loving and generous and you know just normal to me so uh, at one point in my career when i had to shift from a very desi uh, workspace many the desi workspaces where utaita was a kind of normal place to be to working in a very um, individualist workspace where people ordered their own lunch or they went out they didn't check with each other and i would look up and i would be the one person in the office like still at the computer because everybody else had left for lunch i found like such a shock of uh, uh, culture and uh, and for this to happen i didn't have to leave the country or leave and you know write a diaspora novel i didn't even have to leave indranagar you know i was working in an office just off 12th main when this happened to me and i really felt like oh, what a tragedy that there is no one next to me to ask me what i thought right so this this feeling is something that can also translate uh from cultural artif- artifacts from other languages so so when you watch it you may not understand what's going on in korean and you may not understand a lot of specific things but you do understand like the important stuff and that's really you know the joy of reading or the joy of watching uh, like really good movie or a really good tv show and you know we shouldn't fuss so much about the italics is i guess my grand thesis okay and and i think the reason why i i feel that way is closely connected to being someone from bangalore uh, uh, next slide please um so <laughs> the special gifts of bangalore is of course constant construction and flaws uh, but also this amazing ability to speak all kinds of languages somewhat okay somewhat badly also like make a lot of mess in grammar but it doesn't matter you know there is a sort of confidence that comes from living in a multilingual uh, city like bangalore where everybody is like chalo try karte hain mujhe english pata nahi but i'll try it i don't speak hindi i'm going to make all these pulling thrilling things i'll make it like totally like raita but i will do it and you know what's the big deal there is a kind of uh, egalitarianism of well relative egalitarianism of language use which is very special for bangalore where english has since the late 90s and the in the use of english has dominated the economy in a big way not to undersell that but there is also a feeling of mobility linguistically that people feel like okay i can learn to speak english i can learn to speak hindi what is the big deal and that you know just living in a city where uh, in a normal year you could watch movies in six languages right and that is normal that most people you know speak four languages well and that is normal it is it is a great confidence booster it's a great confidence booster it makes you feel okay in the world it makes you feel like you can go anywhere and you can be sort of okay only you can manage you know even if you know you go to work in a place where people don't ask you what are you can be grumpy and just feel all right and i think that is a very special gift of bangalore um uh, next slide please okay so i'm going to tell a uh, like a really terrible joke and it's very hard for me to say it because i can't see you guys and perhaps you're all asleep or perhaps you'll laugh but i'm going to say it anyway because it's one of my favorites so uh, a man uh, from kerala new in bangalore is at the bus stop and he wants to see if the bus that is approaching is the bus that will take him to janagar and with typical uh you know new bangalore malayali confidence he says to the other guy the only other guy at the bus stop e bus jayanagar ge pogumo to which the other guy says poguma irki now this joke either you are laughing or you are not and you need a little bit of kannada and a little bit of malayalam to understand the joke but if you don't understand it please ask someone else and they'll explain it to you anyway i just wanted to say it uh the next slide please uh jain devi is a, like a fabulous language scholar you should look up his work if you don't know him already and you're not like his best friend already uh jain devi argues that india should classify cities with like million plus uh, populations as multilingual territories and i just found this 
super super cool the idea of a multilingual territory rather than being like super language chauvinistic and not getting us anywhere so uh, he said in an interview to mint in 2018 imagine and you know when he talked about multilingual territories isn't it fantastic that the example that he used is bangalore right imagine a city like bangalore where kannada is a mandatory language either as a subject or medium of instruction or both if the city has to have special language resource centers for the other 21 scheduled languages as well as for khasi and garo and tulu and and a few other languages of karnataka it would require about 30 language resource centers if schools formally permit children to spend a day and a half of each week at these special language centers then the special language centers could help children through the languages they understand in revision in tutorial in supplementary work every child can then select one or two language resource centers of his or her choice this would help reduce the clash between the home language and the school language if used imaginatively this would also help soften the clash between the home knowledge home language and the language of knowledge okay i just found this like you know almost like science fiction or fantasy or it's just like thrilling the way of thinking about language use that you could be a, a small child in bangalore with you know perhaps parents from two different languages uh, language backgrounds and then go to school and also choose uh, extra languages that would help you so you can get about in the world and feel more happy and confident and you can speak to your grandmother also and you can speak to you know the teacher also and you can speak to some other kid that you meet in the playground also it just felt fantastic so anyway so this is obviously my idea of linguistic utopia in which we can all understand each other and be very happy and uh, that brings us to the end of my talk thank you shall we take some questions now please <laughs> yes so uh, you can type in your questions or you can unmute yourself and ask the question you could also you know show me your faces on camera yeah you can put okay. on the video hello people i'm very scared <laughs> has this mean that everybody has run away <laughs> talk it was an excellent yeah. talk oh thank you <laughs> thank i you. have never read your work but i will definitely go and look for them now this i come from maharashtra and my language is this is <laughs> okay. like it's a very pretty book you should buy it just for the cover <laughs> i will definitely do that thank you so much it was you a great you were saying talk. about maharashtra sorry yeah i come from maharashtra and my language is very similar to kannada and when i speak with my friend who is who also speaks i think mangalore version of kannada uh -huh. we uh -huh. understand many words from our languages so it is a lot of fun to exchange these words with each other no it's just it's thrilling when it happens when you have like unexpected overlaps <laughs> yeah <laughs> so which is your original language is it's kannada uh, uh, right so my grandparents are from kerala both both sets of grandparents are from kerala one set of grandparents moved uh, to karnataka in their 20s so if you ask me where i'm from i always say i'm from bangalore i mean that's my that's my answer you know so okay <laughs> thank you so much totally welcome <laughs> uh, there are com some comments i will just read them out Sure. Uh, uh this is somebody by somebody called Medha Sharma I want to make a comment and I would uh, I would love this language utopia she says it was an amazing talk thank you so much next one is by Ritu what about when you have a character who would not be expected to speak in english outside the world of story how do you choose to translate into english in that case like in your short story mist call uh, so that is the question right right no so that that's a really good question so um actually with that particular one i i worked very hard not to um see so there is a traditional and i'm sure if if you read fiction you you know this there is a traditional problem of uh, 
English language writers turning non-English speaking characters into simpletons. You know, they like they like they speak in like small small sentences and they speak simple simple thoughts and it's like they are pure children from somewhere. You know, uh, instead, like obviously, just because a person doesn't speak English doesn't mean their brain is like tiny, right? They obviously have complex lives and thoughts and cultures and everything. So the ability to translate that into English without uh, giving it the wrong kind of English is actually really tricky because you are talking about a person who lives in the same city, the same time as you. They are not unexposed to English. They are not unexposed to uh, modern things like videos and TV and uh, pop references and movies and everything, right? But perhaps they they use some slightly different syntax. So. It's it's a kind of fun thing. Like if if I I suspect if people are into uh, math for the fun of solving problems, of the elegance of um, solutions, then they would understand the similarity here. There is a kind of elegant solution that is possible here also if you work at it. Okay, Harshita, please go on. You have a question. Um, I'm not sure that I have a question yet. I really liked your talk. Uh, thank yes, you, Nisha. Thank you. Um, I, I, it made me think about a lot of things because um, we, so I'm in college and we just did a unit on translation and um, uh, we were practicing translating texts for ourselves. And um, the, yeah, I, I think the way you, trans, you have chosen to uh, do your translate, I mean, it, it hasn't, it hasn't been a translation for you. That, that that's the thing. It, um, yeah, I'm just not sure I have questions yet. But uh, your talks just made me think about a lot of things because in our translations, what we were doing uh, was like doing a really literal translation of um, whatever text we'd chosen and kind of leaving um, everything out of it and trying to fit it into. I mean, maybe we were doing that because we were beginners, but I think we were just trying to fit fit it into like a whole anglophone world and um yeah it, it's hard to no, it's find hard it. no hashtag it's hard i i mean i think yeah, translation it's hard to... is very hard but it's also super enjoyable right so yeah. i i just finished translating a short novel uh from malayalam and you know malayalam is my mother tongue and um uh, it's the language i know best after english so um it was not difficult in an obvious sort of way it, I could translate, but to get it like full and fun, you know, and uh, that that was that was hard. But I think if you go into it with the approach that both parties can understand each other and you, the translator, is like some diplomat, you know, going from one world to another world, you are an yeah. ambassador of a culture, then it, it totally works. Right? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting process, yeah. Um, and I, I also really like how you spoke about um, uh, like your main idea of how italicizing things defamiliarizes them. I, I think that's like re a really important point. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to be of service. <laughs> Any more comment or question? Hey, I have a question. Did did my Malayalam joke? Malayalam Kannada joke land at all? Did anybody get it? Sorry. These are my priorities. Finding out whether my totally lame joke worked or not. <laughs> non Malayali audience, I'm really shocked at you. <laughs> no, we did I not. Did, right? I at least did not. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I will explain in detail on the phone. <laughs> Sure, thanks. <laughs> are we um, are we good? Um, uh, there, there, uh, Deepika has a uh, question or comment. Yeah, comment. Deepika, as someone who speaks half Canada and no Malayalam, I didn't get it. <laughs> Anushri says didn't get the joke, but would love to hear the translation. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, just as a general, uh, like a general footnote to that joke. So the explanation of the joke is that the dude is trying to speak Kannada. He's really bad at it. So he's speaking it in Malayalam effectively. He's taken like some half word of Kannada and he's speaking it in Malayalam. So the joke part is not that. The joke part is that the guy who thinks, he thinks is a Kannadiga standing at the bus stop, responds in equally 
crap kannada which is malayalam okay <laughs> so that's the joke it's so it's less a joke about translation and more a joke about how malayalis are like constantly slaughtering every language that they you know confront with they're just speaking all languages in malayalam that that's that's really the joke so i think we are good if okay. nobody has a question uh yeah so uh, thank you nisha thank you so much hey, and this i must uh, admit that this has been a different uh, webinar than uh, the you know others we have had so far thank you for bringing this humor and this you know uh, different perspective into the paraspar series thank you so much nisha it was my pleasure bye bye everyone bye nisha bye thank you bye